Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. In this video, what I'm gonna do is confront anti-intellectualism in New Atheism. Now, if you haven't seen my video on anti-intellectualism in Christianity, I would encourage you to check that out because this video is kind of related to it. And the conclusion that I'm gonna to come to in this video, spoiler alert, is that anti-intellectualism, it's not a problem that's specific to Christianity or atheism. Rather, it's a problem that needs to be addressed and sort of presents itself in different ways depending on the culture and other types of circumstances. So what we're gonna be looking at today is the way anti-intellectualism manifests within new atheist circles, but I've also talked about the way it manifests in Christian circles. So let's go ahead and get started. First thing I need to do is of course qualify what I'm gonna say. This is not aimed at atheism in general. I would actually even argue that atheism was actually a pretty intellectual movement. Looking back at the historical atheists, people like J.L. Mackey, um, who I have a lot of respect for, even though I disagree with him. Um, these are people that could have a very good conversation with theists, and I think we're very good at disagreeing with people and having a productive discussion. But unfortunately, this is not always what we see when we think of atheism today. And what I wanna say here is this is not all atheists. This video is aimed at the ones who are. Um, as NWA said in their song about the police, there are a lot of good cops out there. This one's aimed at the few bad ones. Similarly, this video is just aimed at the types of anti-intellectuals that are present in new atheism and the types of currents and cultural problems that could give rise to new atheism, or sorry, anti-intellectualism in new atheism, not all atheists in general. So if you're an atheist and you're intellectually sophisticated, then this video will not be aimed at you. So don't don't be offended. <laughs> and once again, I'm not claiming this isn't a problem in Christian circles either. I've done a video on this and, you know, accusing me of this would be the two K fallacy anyway. So let's put that to the side. Let's, that would be a red herring. If we want to talk about anti-intellectualism in Christianity, we can have a conversation about that. Something I will continue to address until it is solved, which I think I have my work cut out for me on that. But once again, let's put that to the side. Now, unfortunately, my prediction is that there are going to be many who leave comments on my video based on really fallacious or incredulous, what I call, you know, reasoning in quotes in the comment section, often by looking at the title of my video and leaving a comment. Unfortunately, this does nothing other than prove my point, which is that we actually need to understand the arguments. There's a lack of willingness to engage or understand. So prove me wrong and don't do this. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, you know, you'll be proving my point that I'm making in the video for the people that stay and watch it. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, there are two reasons this is problematic. The first is that it makes atheists look immoral in the sense that people are already having negative view or stereotype of atheists. And then when people argue, well, why aren't atheists respectful of religious people? And they basically say, well, I don't need a reason because, you know, theism is, you know, ridiculous and these sorts of things that makes atheism look immoral. But that's not the main problem that I'm trying to deal with here. The main problem that I want to talk about is that it makes atheists look unwilling or unable to consider the evidence and follow it where it leads. And this can be a problem if the people who are anti-intellectuals are the loudest ones and the ones that are actually have, have reached their atheism as a result of arguments or reason are the ones who maybe are a little bit more cautious to give their reasons. They've thought things through. They're a little bit more nuanced. And unfortunately, it becomes a shouting match. But then the theist who sees this, if they're exposed to a lot of atheists who use poor arguments, they're going to think this is representative of all of atheism, just in the same way that atheists who encounter Christians who are have not really thought through things too much, and those are the loudest people are going to draw this conclusion about all of theism in general. So we got to be careful here. However, what it does end up doing is it undermines strong claims to rationality that are found among many that associate themselves with the atheist movement. So many people will associate themselves with the atheist movement because they want to be taken seriously because they like evidence and reason and these sorts of things. But if people are unable or unwilling to follow the evidence where it leads, then it once again undermines that particular thing. And the one question I want to ask here is what if it's the case that new atheism is in part a social movement that serves a specific purpose or a specific function outside of whether or not it is a true thing or outside of whether or not it is a result of considering the evidence and following where it leads. And what if this purpose is allowing certain people to feel superior to others, especially intellectual, intellectually superior. And if this is the case, then people will associate themselves with this movement outside of the arguments and the evidence. Now, how do we know this? Well, one way we could know this is if new atheists themselves make the same types of errors in reasoning and don't hold themselves to a higher standard of scholarship, it would undermine our reasons for thinking new atheism itself is a rational response to the evidence. And unfortunately, I would argue this is what sometimes happens. 
Now, in particular, I think New Atheism did catch theism, and in particular, like Christianity here, at a time when Christianity's intellectual pants were down. Um, the church was focused very much on emotional type of experiences and maybe neglected the life of the mind, as scholar Mark Knoll says in Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. However, I think churches have indeed responded and have responded very well, at least in some churches, and now it seems that the pendulum might have swung at least in part the other way. So let's talk about what this is. So what do we mean by anti-intellectualism? So one definition, really popular definition, is that anti-intellectualism is hostility to and mistrust of intellect, intellectuals, and intellectualism, commonly expressed as deprecation of education and philosophy. Philosophy is going to be a particular one. We're going to, we're going to um, come back to that later, but keep that in mind. And the dismissal of art, literature, and science as impractical, politically motivated, and even contemptible human pursuits. So notice here, it's a disparaging of fields and then basically arguing, no, it's just kind of a personal thing. It's politically motivated. There's no truth to it. There is no reason we should trust it. And perhaps even worse, there's no reason we should take it seriously. And if that's decided a priori, rather than looking at the evidence, then we're going to have a problem with anti-intellectualism according to this definition. Now, there are three points to anti-intellectualism that I want to talk about, and I'll consider each of these in turn. First being a lack of respect or a lack of engagement towards specific fields of study. The second is rhetoric and logical fallacies that take the place of reason and argumentation. So this is also known as sophistry, something that Socrates and as a result, Plato talked about over 2,500 years ago, so still going on. And then lastly, motivated resistance to certain topics or experts. So this would be having an aversion to certain things, but for reasons other than the actual arguments themselves. It's, I don't like it, therefore I'm not going to take it seriously. This would be a response in the same way that many atheists will accuse Christians of not taking evolution seriously because they have their own presuppositions. We're going to argue that the same thing may happen with atheists and certain types of evidence. So let's go ahead and look at this. So the first is a lack of respect and a lack of engagement towards certain fields of study. And unfortunately, the four horsemen of new atheism, Dawkins, Dennett, Harris, and Hitchens, have all been guilty of this, and we'll talk about each of them in turn. First of all, Dawkins' Richard Dawkins' central argument in The God Delusion rests on a misunderstanding of the Leibnizian cosmological argument and therefore forms a complex question. So Dawkins, what he considers to be his central argument, is the famous who created God objection. Unfortunately, this rests on a misunderstanding of what is implied by the Leibnizian cosmological argument and what is implied by God. Once again, you don't have to think the Leibnizian cosmological argument succeeds, but this is just not understanding what is implied by contingency. So asking who created God, that's a good question maybe for a child or somebody to ask, but somebody who's claiming to represent scholarship or understanding the argument, in my opinion, should be able to do better. And unfortunately, Dawkins is repeating the same error that Bertrand Russell made when he was a youngster um, on this who created God question. This has been discussed at length. Um, unfortunately, Dawkins's treatment of the ontological argument led fellow atheist Michael Ruse to say it was the first time he ever felt bad for the ontological argument. Um, although I do think Dawkins's uh, representation of the ontological argument is, is pretty funny. I, I do think it's pretty funny. Um, but <laughs> regardless, that doesn't mean it's a good, a good rebuttal or a good refutation of it. And that's what we're talking about here. Daniel Dennett, he said in his book on Darwin, um, what you say implies God is a ham sandwich wrapped in foil, tin foil. That's not much of a God to worship. And then other atheists basically said, oh, I love this quote. We're going to use this whenever I'm talking to a theist. This is a. This is not what's what's. Uh, this is not engagement. This is not serious respect towards philosophy of religion. These sorts of things. This is just a dismissal of it a priori. CCK Philosophy, a YouTube channel. I don't even think they're a theist. Um, had the same thing to say about Sam Harris's views in the moral landscape that he just had a lack of respect for the field of moral philosophy. Sam Harris, of course, did his undergraduate in philosophy at Stanford. Once again, the idea being, if you're representing scholarship, you should know better. And Cosmic Skeptic and Alex O'Connor has his own video called The Sophistry of Christopher Hitchens. Um, actually, a very interesting, great video that talks about some of the ways in which Christopher Hitchens misunderstands theistic arguments. So that's worth a watch as well. So these are the four horsemen. I'm accusing each of them at sophistry at some point or lack of engagement. Once again, not to say theists don't do this, but we all need to be doing better. And of course, atheist Michael Ruse said, new atheists do science a, quote, grave disservice, a disservice to scholarship, and that Dawkins in The God Delusion would fail any introductory philosophy or religion course. So it's not just a misunderstanding of these topics, but it's a lack of respect or engagement towards them. And often it's a waste of time for us to hear counter arguments to a position that someone doesn't understand. And there's no 
two-way street of like, hey, am I understanding this argument correctly because this seems like a rebuttal to this argument? Um, theism and, and Christianity in particular has been around for over 2,000 years. There's a good chance there are at least reasonable responses. You may not personally find them compelling, but at least look for what the possible responses can be rather than attacking a straw man or it undermines the case that this is the reasoned response to evidence if you're only looking at the worst versions or misunderstandings. Um, and I think Dawkins in particular should know this, because I, I would argue he's often surrounded by people who misunderstand natural selection, and he has to explain it to them, or they have their own misinterpretations of it. So wouldn't he be directly understanding of these types of misrepresentations? Why would he do the same thing toward theistic or Christian belief? This is a thing I don't understand, or I have trouble understanding why he would have a blind spot in this area, given that I think he's experienced this himself. And once again, it's not necessarily just the misunderstanding itself, because these misunderstandings happen all the time, but it's the lack of a desire to actually understand the arguments in their form or a lack of understanding of what these responses are. It's a lack of engagement with the ongoing literature and the process of scholarship. Peter Bogosian said in a tweet, being published in the philosophy of religion should disqualify one from sitting at the adult table. Well, I'm guessing Peter Bogosian doesn't have any published work in philosophy of religion or his claim would... Uh, basically undermine itself. Although he is the author of a manual for creating atheists, very influential, very popular book. Actually, I think, you know, I do think he makes some mistakes, but I think there are good elements to that book. So I do think it's worth a read for people who are interested. Um, but of course, the qualifier here being, Bogosian has really changed his tune when it comes to Christianity. He basically said, and I'm paraphrasing him here, you might be surprised at my new attitude towards Christianity. I now frequently find myself on the side of Christians against fellow secularists. Very interesting point. Um, Peter Bogosian, I think, has has developed a more nuanced relationship with Christianity, which I think is wonderful, which I think is great. In fact, I had a video I was going to make replying to Street Epistemology and a Manual for Creating Atheists, and I ended up not publishing that video because I realized Peter Bogosian has kind of changed his attitude, and I think I would just be adding fuel to the fire rather than moving the conversation forward. Very interesting. The second point I want to talk about is rhetoric and logical fallacies taking the place of reason and argumentation. And this is a point in which I'm going to hold new atheists to a higher standard because they are the ones claiming to represent reason, evidence, and science. Obviously, there are a lot of Christians who make these types of mistakes with rhetoric and logical fallacies as well. But people who are claiming to represent scientific authority or reason or philosophy, I'm going to expect them to do better just as atheist Jonathan Haidt says he does as well. First of all, is just the continued use of terms like sky daddy or leprechauns. These are just primarily emotive words that don't express any cognitive meaning. If you want to ask the question of, well, isn't isn't uh, how is belief in God different than leprechauns? Well, you can actually have a conversation about that, but just continually comparing these things and not understanding the ways in which theists have reasons for not believing in leprechauns, but believing in God. If you're going to argue theists don't have any reasons, then I don't know really what to say, but if you're arguing that special pleading, you can have a conversation about that. But once again, people aren't arguing. They're not responding to these to these reasons. They're not even seeing any merit in these reasons. It's just the continued throwing around of these words, which once again looks like atheism is serving the purpose of allowing people to feel intellectually superior than other people who are dumb. Even some atheists define their movement with the name of brights, which should give you an inclination for this type of thought. But once again, it's just this is this is the reality of what we often see. Richard Dawkins said in a tweet, Oh dear, I lack a basic understanding of fairies, leprechauns, hobgoblins, elves, little people, pixies, and invisible unicorns. Educate me. Which, of course, we could say to Dawkins, Oh dear, I lack a basic understanding of humans magically appearing from random collisions of atoms. Educate me. Once again, these aren't arguments. These are just emotive statements used to try to manipulate people to accepting a certain position. It's an argument from incredulity rather than actually having a productive or intellectual type of discussion. You can make these comparisons if you want, but once again, these comparisons rest on circular naturalistic presuppositions. So now you're arguing about naturalism and the merits of naturalism, and often this is done in a circular way. I've had this conversation all the time with people, and they often presuppose naturalism is true, and they have an, basically an unhealthy view of science or misrepresentation of the way science is done. We'll talk about that next. But once again, th this isn't moving the conversation forward. You you're free to do this, but don't claim what you're doing is scholarship or, or serious philosophy because this is these are just basic logical fallacies. This is what skeptic noted skeptic P.Z. Meyer says. Many skeptics have no time for philosophy. Skeptics hate and fear it. It's the skeptic kryptonite. His point here is that 
skeptical identity is caught up with feeling superior to other people in the same way that I'm arguing this for some people. And this is why we see when it's the choice between actually taking a reason approach and looking at the evidence and simply throwing out an emotive type of objection, many will take the latter. And then the other problem too is that atheists tend to misunderstand their own objections. So these are two posts or two things by the same person I found online. One is that atheism is a default position, um, that, that theism is belief in God and atheism is a lack of belief in God. But then once again, there's the idea that atheism is also a belief that there is no God. And if you can't even be clear about whether atheism is a lack in belief in God or the actual positive assertion that there is no God, then it kind of crumbles under this surface. There's no consistency about whether or not even the definition of atheism itself, let alone the particulars of this as a particular worldview and these sorts of things. So my point here is that I'm sure these people are not representing atheism in its most intellectual form, but this is what we tend to be exposed to the most, just basic, basic errors in reasoning and things that you know, people who have an introductory experience with philosophy would be able to catch and say, hey, this is inconsistent, this is problematic. And then the last thing I want to say is just motivated resistance. This is point number three, the idea that there are people that have an aversion to belief in God, and this could be potentially clouding their judgment. Um, atheist Jonathan Haidt says, look, you can't use a new atheist as your guide to lessons. And he's talking about specifically lessons about good versus evils of religion. And he says, look, they conduct biased reviews of the literature. And atheist Tim O'Neill, who runs the website History for Atheists, says, after over 10 years of seeing supposed rationalists, most of them with no background in or even knowledge of history, using patent pseudo-history as the basis for arguments against and attacks on religion. Now, he said, I felt someone needed to start correcting the popular misconceptions about history, which are rife among many vocal atheist activists. So these are two atheists that also see a problem with anti-intellectualism or motivated resistance to not just, not just theism, but just to versions of scholarship that, that are incongruent with their picture of the world, a picture of the world where they've already presupposed that religion is bad or false or harmful, and they seem unwilling to actually question this view. Um, as Alex O'Connor, or Cosmic Skeptic, cited, there was a poll of over 80% of atheists that claimed they would not worship God even if they found out he existed. Now, I should mention this does not disprove that God exists or anything like this, but this should make us skeptical that skeptics are really the impartial observers that they often claim to be. And this comes from a, a quote from John Loftus basically saying, I'm basically objective because I'm on the outside looking inside of Christianity, whereas Christians are biased. Well, if Anti-theists or atheists have their own reasons for not wanting God to exist. They could be just as biased. Um, of course, you know, theists often do want God to exist. That, that's, that just doesn't undermine the, that point either. But what this is trying to show, what I'm trying to argue here, is that it's not enough to simply argue one's resistance is only motivated by religious views. It's not enough to say, well, theists believe in God because they want God to exist and it's a comforting lie. Because one could also say, well, Atheists don't want God to exist, and that's a comforting lie, and the objection becomes self-defeating if you're arguing that just wanting something to be true is the only causal factor in what causes people to believe it. So that's, once again, the point. This serves as an undercutting defeater in this particular instance. Once again, just having a better conversation about this, saying, you know, do you want God to exist or not? What reasons do we have? Et cetera, et cetera. That's a more productive discussion than, oh, you guys just believe in God because you want it to be true. And I'm over here activating, basically thinking religion is bad and belief in God is harmful. And that if God existed, I would not want to have anything to do with him. Well, that seems to be its own particular reason that would keep you from being able to, con to find the conclusion that God exists if you think theists are biased in their own reasoning. So it's an inconsistency. And then what we have is a rhetorical use of the word science. And you often see posts like this. Oh, what refutes science? Better science. What doesn't refute science? Re feelings, religion, your favorite politician, and your half-baked opinion after watching two YouTube videos. Now notice here the rhetorical effect of this is putting religion in the same category of feelings and half-baked opinions on YouTube. This is not an argument. You know, if you're going to argue that religion is the same thing as feelings or favorite politicians, you now have a burden of proof to bear to make this a fair comparison. But once again, the point of this meme is not to make a rational argumentation. It's instead to try to argue that we are superior because we trust science and science is a methodology for concerning truth, a tr a, an assertion that itself bears a burden of proof and that has been challenged quite a bit. And what we see here is a wielding of the word science for rhetorical and not logical means. And if you're a theist watching this, or if you're an atheist, be very careful of what people are meaning when they use the word science. What do they mean by science? Do they understand the nuances 
and the technicalities of the demarcation problem? Do they have an aversion to philosophy of science? Do they have a definition of science that is agreed upon by scientists and philosophers of science? Or, or is the word science being used to communicate something else? Or does it have some other particular effect? Um, what we often see here, what I often see, is a lack of understanding of how science is done. And this is unsurprising because few have any published work in scientific journals. So when you see people making claims about what science is and how science is done, what they often mean is trust the experts who are scientists. But what scientists do is they actually perform experiments and tests and come up with theories. They're, you know, Science is not done by just assenting to truth. Consensus is not an epistemology. So people need to understand what they mean by science. And unfortunately, what I think a lot of people do is they don't even read the primary literature. They can't even understand the primary literature. These are very strong claims, but I'm going to try to do my best to back these up. And instead, they have a certain view of science that's misinformed that scientists themselves don't even agree with. And even popular science educators, people like Professor Dave, have, to my knowledge, no published work in scientific journals, which should undermine our trust in their ability to understand how science is done. Now, I'm not questioning people like Professor Dave's ability to understand the literature itself or some of the conclusions based on the literature or the basic fundamental principles going on. Rather, it's a question of whether or not they understand how the practice of science is done and the connection between scientific discoveries and what we consider to be truth and epistemology. This is the main question. And unfortunately, um, what we end up seeing here is kind of like the blind leading the blind. We have people following popular science educators who have no published work or experience actually doing science, getting their idea of how science is done from these people who once again may themselves not have an accurate view of how science is performed in the different fields of study. And there's a lack of willingness to even try to understand how this is done because once again, the word science or wielding science has its own rhetorical strategy that is beyond whether or not it actually produces truth or not. So we need to be very careful about this. So what's the conclusion here? I've spent a lot of time hopefully talking about some of the issues I see in new atheism and some of the anti-intellectual currents. What do, what's the point here? What do I mean? Well, the point here is that atheists and theists and Christians and non-Christians and anti-Christians are we're all susceptible to anti-intellectualism. And this is a problem that has more to do with motivated reasoning and a lack of respect for scholarship than atheism or theism in particular. And I think the big problem is not being willing to follow the evidence where it leads, not being able to follow the arguments where it leads and change our own views. As I like to say, you want to be correct, you need to give up your need to be right. You need to be able to question or not whether or not you could be wrong about something to possibly reach truth about it. And it seems that far too, few, far too few theists and atheists are willing to give up their need to be right because they don't care about being correct. They just want to be right. There's a difference between, you know, feeling right about yourself, being self-righteous and actually finding truth, which involves humility. We need to do better across the board, right? And this is like Tim O'Neill and Jonathan Haidt, Theists need to be unafraid to call up bad scholarship and bad reasoning on their own side, just as there are many brave atheists who are unafraid to go after people that they think are misrepresenting scholarship or having an aversion to scholarship. I have deep respect for these people, and I have deep respect for the theists, people like Mark Knoll, who wrote Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, um, scholars like James Davison Hunter, who was unafraid to call out high, very prominent theologians for the same reason. The point that I want to make here is there are no sides to truth or scholarship, right? We all work together as partners to find truth. And we may come to different conclusions, but this doesn't mean we're not on the same team of trying to find truth. So I am the theist. I believe Christianity is true. And there are atheists who I see as my partners. We've come to different conclusions. We disagree about where the evidence leads, but we're working together to try to find truth and trying to do better. And that's the point. So thanks for watching. And hopefully we can have a productive discussion in the comments. See ya.